Hey, deserving listeners, it's time to continue our journey watching 90 Day Fiance. As I always say, never use this video or any other video on YouTube as a replacement for therapy. If you need therapy and you need in-person services, make sure you get it. You deserve it. Let's get to the show. Why? I think it's because I've just been around you for so long that I feel like I don't have any privacy at all. Like, zero. Mm. So okay. it's not the fact that I'm trying to keep things from you. It's just like I have like such a thin layer of privacy that I feel like everything. I try to give you as much privacy as no, possible. You, you do a great job, but there's also <clears throat> other things as well. I feel like I just think a lot about what happened in Brazil with Jess and just Jess in general. All right. So two thumbs up for Colt and Debbie for having this conversation. It, there's probably going to be some tension and some hurt feelings, but what a fantastic opportunity to realign their relationship so that they don't run into the same problems of the past and they can actually enjoy a relationship that's different. So let's see how they, they work this out. My relationship with my mother and the way she treats me are very important aspects in moving forward in any relationship I choose to have. I don't think she understands exactly how I want her to treat me. And I really need to tell her these things in order for me to grow. I should not have loved Jess. I go from one relationship to the next, doing the same pattern over and over and over again. And I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to break free of those well, chains. Well, then that's what you have to do. And I will always try to look out for you. I don't care if you're 90 years old. So it's interesting that I think Colt headed into this conversation wanting to quote unquote, draw a boundary with his mom. And they've both just quickly slipped back into a very common dynamic where he is talking about his mistakes and she is explaining to him. Unless, you know, you tell me back off or something. It's not that I don't want you to be too much of a mother. I just don't want you to interfere so um, brazenly. I feel like it's not a good way for me to live as a healthy adult. I'm your son, but the way you treat me as an adult is the same way women treat me. Like, Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to go over well. <laughs> Now we're getting into an accusation. So if he had a therapist, I'm guessing he would have had some discussions about what to say and what not to say. This is a classic uh, thing that you would never say in a situation like this, which is, mom, this is your fault. You treat me badly. She doesn't feel that way. She feels like she's treating him well, that she's protecting him from bad things. And you can make an argument that she was right that, you know, these past relationships weren't good for both people. <laughs> but uh, what you want to do is to say something like, look, I, I love you and I want to have a relationship with you and I want to be close to you and I want you to be a part of my life. I don't want that to ever change. I need you. And I feel like you feel like you have a lot of jurisdiction over my love life and it just gets me all messed up in my head and I can't think for myself. I want to make my own mistakes, mom. I want to fall on my own face and I I don't want you to intervene so much cuz it stresses me out. I'm I'm dealing with a relationship which is very stressful to me and then you enter the mix and now I'm worried about you. So Okay, maybe you know you're up, you're trying to help, but it ends up just making things. You know, it's too many cooks in the kitchen. Something like that is not accusatory, right? You're not saying you're a bad person or you treat me badly. You're just like, this is what I need to move forward because these are this is how it affects me. When you involve yourself in that way, it it freaks me out. It overwhelms me or something like that. Instead of accusing her of something. So let's see how this goes. Even just doing things like cooking and cleaning, like I feel like these women look at that like, oh, well, he's just dependent. And then that's why these girls go after you because they see you as a direct competition. I think you treating me like a man would be like the best thing that ever happened to me in terms of relationships. I don't agree, Colt. <laughs> I don't think the best thing 
that could happen in your relationships is that your mom changes her approach to your dating life. I think the best thing that you could do is to go to therapy and to investigate your attachment anxiety and your relationship anxiety. I think that would be the best thing that you could do. In fact, if you did that, you probably wouldn't need to change anything about your relationship with your mom because you would be so much more sure about what to do. You know, when we look back at the Jess situation, yeah, your mom invited herself to Brazil, but you didn't have to agree. You could have said no, and you said yes, even though you didn't really want to say yes. So it's not that your mom involves herself. I mean, that you could say that that's part of the problem, but I'm guessing your mom would have lived with it if you said no. So it's more of a matter of learning about your anxiety relationship-wise, learning other ways to cope with it, getting support around that. And that's the main thing. Just, I, I can't imagine a world where, okay, fine, you managed to draw a boundary with your mom, and then we believe that your relationships are going to be fantastic. I, I, I don't imagine that would happen. Who knows? I can't predict the future, but that's not the direction I would go in. I do treat you like a man. What do I, what do I baby no. you? What do I no, do? No, I'm, I'm just saying, like, I mean... I think you think I have more power over you than I do. I don't control your life. I never said you did. Look at me. I, I feel like you're my mother, but we don't have a friendship. And that bothers me. I, I want to get to know you better. I want to know who you are. And That is fantastic. I mean, I, I wasn't even going to mention that because that's not something that I thought we'd get into. But that is absolutely something that I would do and have done with many clients with work like this. We call it family of origin work. And the one of the main things that you can help yourself and help everyone and your relationship with your parents is to become more like friends with them. It depends on the culture. Some cultures lend themselves to this more easily than others, but meaning that you get to know them. In a, you know, when we're five and 10 and 15 years old, optimally, our parents are kind of separate from us. They, they seem like they've got it all together and we're not worried about our parents, optimally. A lot of kids have to worry about their parents because their parents are sick or they have some mental issue or relationship problem or addiction problem or something, and that can cre create problems. But optimally speaking, children shouldn't have to worry that much about their parents because they should be worrying about themselves. And we agree that that's, that's healthy. Later on in life, if we retain that relationship where the parents are always taking care of the kids and it's more of a one directional relationship, which is great when the child is 10. But as, as you turn into an adult, there can be a transition. Now, sometimes it's, it's never like truly uh, equals because some parents will always, and some kids will always want a little bit of that. But if you head in that direction, a lot of really great things can happen. You can get closer as a, you know, mother and a son when she doesn't have to worry about protecting you from the world anymore because then it, that's what I was talking about you know before was you can if you transition from one style of relationship to another you gain closeness in a way that you couldn't be close earlier because it was it was there was a hierarchical nature to the relationship and so that's this is great I, I hope that this actually appeals to the mom and they can both set out on that goal of like, oh, okay, let's become more friends where mom, you might have opinions about the people I'm dating, but you don't consider it your job to intervene in the way that you do now, which is not what I want. I will commend them. They're both having a great, con you know, as I said in the beginning of this conversation, it's going to have some tension. It's going to have some uh, some bumps in the road. There's going to be some weird moments, but they're, you know, they're sticking with it and they're talking to each other. I would imagine there'd be at least another three dozen conversations that they're going to need to have or, along these lines, but this is a great start. Well, why don't you find out who you are first and then you can find out who I am. Are you mad at me? Yeah. Which is all part of the process. And if he was in therapy, his family of origin therapist would say, your, your mom's going to get angry at first because it feels like a rejection to them. They, they don't trust that there's a better relationship on the other side of that transition. All they see is the chasm 
and they just see rejection and they just see, wait, you're rejecting me as your mother? I'll always be your mother. And there's certain ideas that it's a whole paradigm shift. It's shifting from I am responsible for you and I'm protective of you and I'm involved in your life even, even if you don't want me involved in your life, which would be true for a 10-year-old, right? We want, a, we want a mother to be involved in their 10-year-old's life, even if the 10-year-old's like, I don't want you involved. I want to do it myself. It's like, no, I'm your mother. I'm in charge of things. And, you know, there's a little wiggle room there, of course, but we expect that. And as an adult, we need to shift or it, sometimes we benefit from shifting. But to the mother, it feels like a rejection. It feels like you're, you just want to fly away from me. You just, you just want to get rid of me. That's what it feels like. You're just dropping me in an old folks home and, and I'm never going to have a relationship with you again. Because they don't know what's on the other side of that transition. So that's why it requires a family therapist to really guide everyone through that. It's like, mom, I hear you. you f do you feel rejected right now? Yes, I feel rejected. Do you feel scared of what he's proposing? Yes, I feel scared. Yeah, I, I hear you. It's normal. But let's all work together so that you can be close after this transition and maybe even closer than you were before. And mom, you get the benefit of releasing yourself from the job of having to worry about him. He is now saying, I'm ready to take the wheel. You don't have to have a hand on the wheel anymore. You can just look out the window and enjoy yourself on this drive. You don't have to be hypervigilant about how this guy is driving the car. He wants to drive the car on his own. He needs to drive the car on his own. So there's a lot of talk that can help. But I will say that they're hitting a bit of a crisis and that she's now angry and good for Colt for calling that out. She, she got defensive. She's like, well, maybe you should get to know yourself first before you get to know me. And Colt very wisely intuited like, oh, are you mad at me? And he even said that. And she says, yeah, I'm mad. So this is, this is going really well. It's going very much according to plan. Hey, Deserving Listeners, as you know, I'm constantly recommending that people go to therapy. We all need therapy from time to time. One of the options available that is definitely worth checking out is BetterHelp.com. So if you're looking for a therapist, I would give it a try by going to BetterHelp.com slash Kirk. Make sure you use the slash Kirk because you get 10% off your first month and it helps us out. I get a lot of emails from you saying that you're looking for a therapist. As you watch these videos, I know many of you have been motivated to find your own therapist but I know it can be really hard to find a good one to work with. Like I said, one of the options available to try is betterhelp.com slash Kirk. And you should know that this service is available to clients worldwide, which is amazing. I've been told that you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can message with your counselor anytime. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. And I've been told that it's often less expensive than in-person therapy. So go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk to get 10% off your first month of therapy today. I'm sorry. I don't make you feel uncomfortable. I love you. You've never done anything wrong, Mom. Please look at me when I talk to you. I love you. You're my mother. And you have the best intentions for me. And I know that. And I love you. Please hold, let me hold my hand. Don't be upset, please. I need to go. So it's hitting a nerve for the mom, which is totally expected. It's fine. You, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, as they say, and this is part of that process. You can't make this transition without there being some anxiety and some pain. And I'm guessing the mom has a lot of pain in her history, and it has a frequent feeling of pain, and it just piles up and piles up. And the one thing that she can depend on is her relationship with Colt and retaining that mother-son relationship. And now that's being thrown away in front of cameras. That can be very, very distressing. It, it's, this moment is okay if the campaign progresses, if Colt and Debbie sit down again and say, Mom, let's talk again about it. Uh, I, I want you to understand that I do love you and I want a relationship with you. I want to get closer to you, but I don't want you to feel like you're responsible for me. You know, just keep clarifying that. So this is going well. I feel bad for both of them. I feel bad for the mom in particular, but this is a great start. I just hope that they don't give up. Go to the restroom. I think he blames me for everything. If you listen to what he's telling, he does. So it's very frustrating as a parent to know 
when to keep your mask set and when not to, but you don't want to see your child hurt or go through worse agony that he's already going through. Right. So she's, you know, feeling all the good feelings that, that a mother should feel. Like, uh, you know, I see him getting too close to the ledge. Shouldn't I say something? Would I be, wouldn't I be a bad mother if I didn't go over and grab him and pull him away from the edge of the cliff? Yeah, these are all questions that parents ask themselves throughout their lives. I mean, as soon as the kid gets old enough to start walking, it's like, uh, you know, when, when do I step in and grab the kid so the kid doesn't fall? When do I literally allow the kid to fall on their face so that they can learn that they can do things on their own? It's a constant debate that parents have. And she's having it, and it's fine. Uh, it's normal for her to have these emotions. If they just keep at it, I'm guessing that they're definitely going in the right direction for both people. It's not just for Colt. It's for her, too. Like I said, she benefits from this transition, and she has to know that. She has to know that she – and Colt was kind of saying that. It's like, I want to be your friend. I, I want to transition to another relationship where we're actually closer. So I'm very encouraged by this conversation, really. I just really hope that they stick with it. But I know that I have to let him figure things out. If he thinks that I'm being overly motherly to him, fine. I don't have to make his bed, and I don't have to wash his clothes. He's a grown man. He should be doing this himself, so it'll be a cold day in hell before I wash his clothes again. Okay, so good. Now you're seeing the light. You're like, wait, so he, he doesn't want me to worry about him and be involved in the nitty-gritty of his life. Well, that means I don't have to do any of his stupid laundry or make his bed anymore. Yay for me. Yes, it's a win-win. <laughs> or, it, you know, you, you have to give up something, but you gain a whole other side of this stuff. So, you know, look at that happiness. That's good. There's a lot of other things like that, too. Okay, I lose that type of closeness with him, but I gain a different kind of closeness with him. Maybe he could actually worry about me and my dating life or something like that. <laughs> I feel like after what happened tonight, this is definitely a red letter day for my mother and I. This conversation is something that I needed to do a long time ago. I feel like there's this invisible weight on my shoulders that I didn't really know existed. I feel like my mother's provided a nice safety net for me for my entire life, but I feel like if I want other women to treat me like a man, I need her to treat me like one as well. Okay, I, I don't know about that so much. I mean, clearly with Larissa and Jess, that was true. They seem to really focus on that. But there's a way to have a relationship, even with the current style of relationship he has with his mom. But I think what I, the way I would frame it is that in order for Colt to learn how to stand on his own two feet, to make decisions on his own without undue outside influence, to begin to say, you know what, maybe part of this is my fault. I mean, one of the problems of having a constant parent around fixing things for you is that you are in a constant state of feeling like, well, if something, like when I just think about myself, when I was 15 years old and something went wrong in my life, like, I don't know, I needed a new pair of shoes or the toilet had a problem or, I don't know, I had a pain in my arm or something, I would immediately just say, well, my parents will take care of it. I just would alert to my parents, like, my arm hurts. And then I just wait, you know, because th that's, that's the role of a child with a parent, right? Um, now, 15, maybe it's a little old for that. But you get my point. You know, when you're young, you just have a sense that your parents, optimally, if you're being raised right, your parents are there and have more power and more know-how and more security and uh, know what to do when, when something's wrong with your life. And if you're 35 and your mom is still there watching out for you, then you might just feel like, well, my mom will take care of it. If something's wrong, my mom will tell me if something's wrong. If there's something to be addressed, my mom will address it or my mom will tell me to address it. So I'll just wait. And, and I, I don't have the, the power or the role in my life to really be the first responder. Maybe, you know, that's another metaphor is like, is like when I, when I hear about a, 
a fire going on, you know, let's say that the neighbor's house is on fire. Well, I call 911. I don't run over to the house and try to put out the fire because I'm not a fire person. I don't do that kind of work. That's not my job. Well, if I was a fire or I was the fire department, uh, I wouldn't call 911 if I saw a fire. I would actually drive, you know, I'd get all the people and we'd go over there and we'd put out the fire. Well, when you are a child and treated like a child, then sometimes that affects your mentality and you just think, okay, well, I'll just wait for someone to tell me what to do. Whereas if you don't have that, you're the first responder. You're the person holding the wheel. You're the person in charge. You're the top of the pyramid. You're the president of your country. So you have to make the choice and you have that assumption. Something happens and you're like, okay, Let's figure out what to do here. It's my, no one else is going to pick up the pieces. I need to address this head on. But there's a transition period there where when this is released or as it slowly becomes released, meaning the parent slowly allows the child to make their own choices, and there's pros and cons to that. The child is like, yay, I'm on my own, but oh, no, I'm on my own. And the parent is like, yay, he's on his own, and oh, no, he's on his own. So, you know, there's, there's that transition period. And the child will make mistakes and the child will have to, will want to run back to mom and say, oh, I made a mistake. But the, both people have to say, no, it's not what we're doing here. You're, you're going to make that mistake. You, yes, you made the mistake and you might make that mistake again, but it's your life and you get the benefits of the freedom and the control over your own. It's a transition period. There's a lot of things that happen there, but it changes your paradigm as a child. When that happens, you end up having what we call personal authority, actually a local author and professor Donald Williamson wrote about this topic called personal authority. You can look up uh, the book on Amazon. You can, it's called the Intim Intimacy Paradox. And it goes over all this stuff that he believed in his model. He did group therapy around this. He believed that this process began when you were 30 years old and you couldn't actually begin this process until you were 30. So he had uh, he saw this as a lifespan of a developmental task that just because you were 18 and you're considered an adult, you probably didn't have actual personal authority yet. I think he was mainly referring to Americans and, and maybe even Seattleites because he's from around here. I think he taught at Bastyr, which is nearby. Anyway, the point is, is that once you're 30, 40, 50, you can enter into this process of gaining your own personal authority, which means that you you release yourself, you, you shift the relationship you have with your parents so that you consider yourself to be the top of the pyramid and you gain this relationship of, of friendship and, and even maybe more intimacy with your parents. And he goes over the whole thing in the book. It's a whole treatment protocol. And it involves having certain kind of formal statements that you give to your parents. It involves everything I've been talking about right now. There's also family of origin work. You can look up that as well. Uh, Framo did a lot of work on that. It's a general family systems idea that we've been investigating and working on clinically for decades. But, but anyway, so he's talking about that. And so this is great. I, I feel really great about this. The worry I have is that they won't persevere through the process, that it'll just be like in and out, and then like it'll just go back to the way it was. I know she's worried about me, and she doesn't want me to be alone, but I think we can grow and learn and Hopefully, in the end, it can improve my relationship with any woman I choose to spend the rest of my life with. Yes, but you need to go to therapy yourself and figure out why you had so much anxiety that you resorted to lying. That's just my hypothesis, but there's, there needs to be some investigation and some awareness about w why it was that he decided to lie so often. That needs to be investigated fully because if he doesn't, this is probably going to happen again, regardless of his configured relationship with his mom. I recognize you because we're fatter than ever. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Larissa, you don't look like the woman I married. I'm going to call you Larissa McGillicuddy. I'm going to call you Coach Cookie Holdy. What about that? Coach <laughs> Yeah. Uh, these tell-alls, I swear to goodness that I don't even know if I want to watch them, honestly. <laughs> it's just ridicule of each other. Who can be the coolest ridiculer? Who can be the best bully on television? It's just, it's just awful to watch. 
I sent pictures of my d- out to women because Ugh. that's what I do for affection. Disgusting. When I think my girlfriend is broken up with me, doesn't give me affection, says she's going to go bang uh, her, always the problem bang is her woman. friend, it's bang never some guy you. in Chicago, bang some guy in Washington, D.C., bang some uh-huh. guy over there. You have no morals. You have no morals, bitch. Whatever, dude. I wish you'd have sent me one of it. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, if you... Well, usually they... Uh, so we reach out. She, they usually reach out to me. And then they suddenly I receive pictures of them. So I only think it's polite to return the favor. Hey, everyone. Let me know what you think about this episode in the comments below. I'm really curious. I always read the comments. I'm always wondering what people think about the show and what I'm saying. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.